Well, good morning, everyone. And my name is Justin Stofa, and I am so excited to be worshiping with you this morning. We don't think it's any accident that you're tuning in. In fact, we've been praying for you. We are one church in multiple locations. That's right. I'm Christine Megason, and if you're new to Hope, special welcome to you. You'll see the New to Hope booth there right behind us here in West Des Moines in the atrium. But there's a New to Hope button there on your screen, so it's a great way for you to click fill out a little information about yourself that helps us get to know you and you can get to know us. We would also love to be praying with you. We're a church that believes in the power of prayer. And so you can go to our website, lutheranchurchofhope.org. And what's really cool is you can submit a prayer request and know that it'll be prayed for. And you can also see other prayer requests and you can pray for other people in our church family as well. So I want to encourage you to pray this morning. That's right. A reminder that we'll be doing a book study uh, as a church. It's called The Third Option by Miles McPherson. So more coming about that, but you can be grabbing your book now. Yes, make sure you check that out. We're so glad that you're joining us for worship this morning. Worship is about to begin. The band's in place. We're going to send it inside. Again, thank you for being here and welcome to Hope. All right, good morning. Thanks for joining us at Hope today. We're so excited to worship with you. If you're joining us online, we invite you to stand and sing with us. So we sing to our King who's worthy of our praise. So come on, let's sing it together. Come let us worship our King And come let us bow at His feet For He has done great things And see what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things Yes, He has done great things Sing it out now Oh, hero of heaven You conquer the grave You free every captain Break every chain
That's enough because of his great love for us. We're not separated from that by anything. He's here for us always. So let's celebrate that and sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. For you, oh, yes. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Yeah, for you. truth that he loves us more than anything he's here he loves you so much come on let's sing it he said and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you
God, we thank you for the love that you have for us. And Lord, let us ever be confident that we can build our lives on that love. Not anything that we have ever done, not anything that we can accomplish or try to do. We don't have to earn your love. It is a gift that you give so freely. If you're here today and that's something that you haven't done or maybe it's something that you're trying to achieve or you feel like you have to be good enough or you have to do the right thing or say the right thing, just want you to know today that there is nothing you can do to earn God's love. It is free. And even more great is the truth that there isn't anything that can separate us from that love. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love never changes. So God, we thank you for that. And as we just sang, Lord, help us build our lives on that. Help us receive that love so that we can give it to those around us. That we put our trust in you. The one thing in our life that stays the same. The one thing in our life that will never let us down and will never fail. We love you too so much because we have hope in your love. We have hope in your name. The name that is above all names. And it's in that name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Now before you're seated, what you have been taught to do, I know instinctively. You just go for that. But we're going to do our Bible reading in just a moment. So before you do that, turn around and say hi to those around you. Say, hey, welcome to Hope. We're glad you're here. It's no accident that you're here. And remind them tomorrow is, April, is uh, August 1st. Summer is almost over. So glad that you're tuning in. No matter where you're joining us from, it's good to be church together. We hope you're having a great morning. And stay tuned. The Bible reading is coming up next. All Bible reading comes from the Old Testament, Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Do not think that because you are in the king's house alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place. But if you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but that you will have come to your royalty position for such time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And, my, and I, my attendants, will fast as you do. And then this is done. I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Here ends the reading. This is Hope 360, your weekly look around Lutheran Church of Hope. I'm Jacob Burr. And I'm Shannon Baker. After our VBS kids did such an amazing job of gathering items for our local food pantries, we turn our attention to our annual back to school drive focused on collecting thousands of school supplies for children in Central Iowa. All donations will be distributed to area schools this fall to serve students of low income families. Just another great opportunity for us as a congregation to help out and serve our local communities. You can visit our website at hopewdm.org slash school drive to see the school supply list and volunteer to sort items. Starting August 1st, you can drop off your donations in the atrium. Thank you, Hope, for continuing to be the church. Summer is in full swing, and our Power Life and Ignition Ministries are gearing up for their third first Wednesday event of the year on August 3rd. All students entering grades 6 through 12 are invited to join us for an outdoor event in the parking lot with live music, free food, fun games, and prizes from 7 to 9 p.m. It's our final first Wednesday of the summer, and we've saved the best for last. We're going to have lots of fun games, Gaga Ball, we're going to have inflatables, there'll be live music, we're giving away prizes. Jake in the kitchen is making chicken sandwiches. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure you bring a friend. It's for any student going into grades 6 through 12. It's going to be a blast. We'll see you there. Registration is available on our website. Visit hopewdm.org slash first dash Wednesday. For all the women of hope, there will be a Women's Wilderness Escape October 4th through the 8th in beautiful Grand Marais, Minnesota. Our Women's Wilderness Escape has been rescheduled for October 4th through the 8th. And this trip is open to anyone, whether you were signed up for the first trip or not. We have two options for you. There's the canoe trip, which is definitely more roughing it, and you'll go deep into the Boundary Waters, uh, sleeping in tents, and exploring by canoe. There's also the on-base experience. 
If sleeping in a bunk style lodging is more your speed, then that is the trip for you. Registration is open and we know that when we set aside this time to just focus our hearts on God, God will show up for us in amazing ways. I hope you can join us. It's gonna be an awesome time. For more details about costs and registration, please visit our website. This Friday, August 5th, young and old are invited to join us for a free family-friendly movie in the West Des Moines Worship Center. The lights go down at 6.30 for the two-hour movie. Popcorn will be provided, and feel free to bring a treat from home as well as drinks with a lid. That was your 360-degree look around Lutheran Church of Hope. We're glad you joined us, and welcome to Hope. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. My name is Justin Stofa. I'm on staff as our junior high minister, and we don't think it's any accident that you're here this morning. In fact, we believe that God has brought all of us together for worship this morning. Whether you're here in this room or you're joining us online, it is good to be the church together. We are one church in multiple locations. If you're new today or you're visiting, please know you're amongst friends. If you've got questions, we'd love to help answer your questions, point you in the right directions. Maybe you've been around for a while and you're looking for that next opportunity. Maybe it's a service project or a mission trip or you want to help volunteer in some way. Uh, we would love to help point you in the right direction. So stop by after their service. Uh, catch us at New to Hope, and we'd love to visit with you out there. Our service will now continue with a word of prayer, so would you please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you that at a moment's notice we can come to you. We are so grateful for this moment right here, right now, to just be still and to be in your presence. God, you know the situation we're in. You know the season that's coming up. You know the circumstances that we're facing. And so today, God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're always with us. We thank you for your promises that you have good plans for us. In the midst of the joys that we celebrate and the sorrows and the pain, you are there every step of the way. Lord, we are grateful. And so we put our faith and our hope and our trust in you. Lord, fill us up today. In this space, open our hearts to receive your joy, to receive your peace and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your unending love. We pray this prayer and the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It is good to pray together. It is good to worship together. And we are a church that's on a mission together. If you'd like to give an offering to that mission to reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ, you can do that. You can give. There's uh, containers in the back on your way out. You can go online and find it on our website. Most importantly, thank you for sharing your gifts and for being part of this mission that God has called all of us to here at Hope. Now, we have an offering of music this morning, and you are in for a treat. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm so glad we came to worship this morning because the Hope Jazz Band is here. So as they give an offering, let's give them a warm welcome. This is Reverend Jack.
find that the F-14 flat spin was induced by the disruption of airflow into the starboard engine. This disruption stalled the engine, which produced enough yaw rate to uh, induce a spin which was unrecoverable. There was no way Lieutenant Mitchell could either see or avoid the jet wash which produced the engine stall. Therefore, the Board of Inquiry finds that Lieutenant Pete Mitchell was not at fault in the accident of 29 July. Lieutenant Mitchell's record will be clear to this incident. Lieutenant Mitchell is restored to flight status without further delay. These proceedings are closed. Get him up flying soon. hard to imagine. It's been 36 years since that movie came out. For me, that was uh, a movie that shaped a lot of my childhood, uh, and it's been so fun because this year, 36 years later, I don't know if you heard the summer that the next Top Gun came out. They did a really bad job of promoting it. I'm totally joking. Uh, but my wife and I were both ki- uh, about the same age as our kids were uh, when the original Top Gun came out to what our kids are now when the second Top Gun came out. And so we've been watching it. It's been a Top Gun summer for us. Uh, and that scene that you saw there was a scene that kind of is the, the, the pivoting scene for the entire uh, first movie. I was getting that clip ready uh, with, uh, at our house on Friday. My daughter was sitting next to me. They've seen it. Uh, but I, I forgot that there's a lot of language in that movie. Um, but as we're, I was like telling our production team, like, take that out, take that out, take that out. Please take that one out, take that one out. Uh, and as I was doing that, I'm telling my da- daughter, earmuffs, 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 like don't listen to that. But as we we're getting the clips ready, uh, and I was asking her opinion, she said, hey dad, uh, what, what happens if you ruin the ending of Top Gun for all the people who are going to be in worship this, uh, this week? And I said, sweetheart, if they haven't watched it in 36 years, that's their own problem. <laughs> like I'm not going to talk to you about the new one, but I'm going to talk to you about the old one because if you haven't done that, that's your fault, not mine, and I'm not going to burden, uh, I'm not going to bear that burden for you this morning. But what Pete Mitchell, Maverick, Tom Cruise, who just as a side note, 36 years later, doesn't look any older at all, I want to know who his dietitian is because I need to be eating the same stuff. But what he experiences is an intersection. It's the crux of the whole movie. It actually becomes the crux of the whole second movie. You saw it when he was in front of the board of inquiry that he had uh, been in a crash. He and his ROI, I've learned, because there are a lot of you that know a lot more about the flying stuff than I know. And so I've heard all about it, like what a wingman is, what an ROI. Goose was his ROI, the guy that sits behind him. But Maverick and Goose had been on this training mission in the middle of it. Uh, they'd gotten themselves, Maverick had gotten them into trouble. And they uh, had spun out of control into a flat spin that was unrecoverable. And in the middle of it, it gets to be obvious that they need to eject. They need to get out. And they pull the lever and as they start to go out, you know the story if you've watched it, that goose hits the top and he ends up up dying. And at that point, Maverick, his, his whole career hits an intersection he never would have guessed. He was a pilot that loved to run things on the red line. He would love to run it in the red. He would take chances. It was just the way he was wired. It was the way he flew. He couldn't fly any other way. 
But now everything had changed. I mean, in, in, in one moment, deservedly so. In one moment, even though he had been cleared of any wrongdoing, in one moment, everything had changed and it had caused Maverick now to disengage from the thing that he had been wired to do. And that happens, doesn't it? Something happens and it's not that our path like kind of veers one way or the other. It's literally the path that we've been on. It, 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 it ends. Like there's no way forward any longer. We find ourselves uh, in an intersection of life, and we all know it. We know it intellectually, but when we experience it, it's a whole, experience it, it's a whole different thing. We know that life is all about intersections. God has created us with this incredible ability to adapt to our situations, but it doesn't mean that it comes easily. We tell our kids all the time that life is nothing more than a series of reactions. So you have no way, that, no way to know the way that your day is going to play out. And so you got to be able to, to control the way you react. Your day so far, whether you're here with us in person, whether you're joining us online, has been a series of reactions. Chances are you may have had an alarm clock that went off this morning. And you had the choice. Am I going to hit the snooze button or am I just going to get up? You had a choice. Chances are some of you you came in contact with somebody in your house that was in a horrible mood this morning. And you had a choice. Am I going to respond to them <laughs> with equal negative force or am I going to give them grace? Chances are if you've been driving this morning, maybe somebody followed you too close or maybe somebody cut into your lane in a way that you didn't necessarily like, and you had a choice. Am I going to wave to them with all my fingers or without all my fingers? <laughs> it's a series of reactions. And unfortunately, most of the intersections that we face and that we remember, they're not so easy. And so then the question becomes, what do we do? The question for Maverick was, what, what was he going to do now? He had people that were telling him, you need to engage. You heard it in the clip. He, we need to get him back to flying. But he didn't know to how to make sense of life the way that it was, the way that it was now. And how it was going to play out, well, who knows? This last week, my uh, family and I were able to go up to my parents' lake cabin. It's something we do every single summer. It's our favorite week of the summer. We just absolutely love it. When we go up there, it's just the four of us, my wife Bridget, our son Trey, our daughter Jade, myself, and then my mom and my dad. And it's just a week where we can unplug from so many things and we can plug in to so many different things. And we're able, I'm able to share with my kids uh, things that I did when I was their age. And it's so much fun. We have all these traditions that we do. And one of the traditions that we have started to do is uh, we go to uh, breakfast in this place. It's about 55 minutes away from our cabin. How do I know that? Because every time we get in the car, our kids ask, how long is it going to take until we get there? So about two years ago, I started timing it. So I'm like, 55 minutes, guys. Buckle up. It's going to be fine. But we go to this place, uh, it's near Park Rapids, Minnesota. It's this logging camp where they actually have a logging camp that was in use uh, years and years and years ago. And now they've turned it into kind of this touristy thing where stuff is so stinking expensive. Our daughter's like, can I get a bracelet? I'm like, do you want to leave your kidney? That's a choice you have to make. <laughs> and we go there and they actually have a dining hall where you get to eat in the same place that all the loggers would eat when that place was in use. And they put in front of you food that was meant to sustain people who were cutting down trees all day. And you eat like it. And then for the rest of the day, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten all of that. Well, it was on Thursday morning. We are going to go to logging camp. And so my dad's like, hey, why don't we take our car? And I thought, your gas? That's great. Wonderful. So we hop into their car. Everybody piles in. We start. And he's like, hey, would you drive for us? I'm like, sure. Would love to drive. We'll get there a little faster if I drive. That's going to be wonderful. And so we start to go, we get about uh, 10 minutes into the trip, and I hadn't thought to look at the gas gauge, because why would I? 
My dad offered to use their car. Surely he would only offer if he knew there was enough gas in the tank to get us where we needed to go. But all of a sudden, I, I, I look at the gas tank and I say, hey, dad, when's the last time you filled your car up with gas? He's like, oh, it's been a while. And I s started to put the dis push the display button on the car. And then you get the screen that says miles to doomsday, or it's like miles to empty, I mean. And I realized that at this point, we still have like 46, 47 miles to get to where we're going. And it's like miles to empty is like 34. Yeah, I know. It's the same way I felt. And I said, hey, uh, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like, is there a gas station up here? And my dad's like, well, there's one like 20 miles back, but that would add so much to the trip. So I, I remember when you kids were little, there was a place that we used to stop just up the road. And I was like, how far is up the road? He's like, I don't know. It's just up the road. I said, could you just tell me? Because I don't want to play this who knows game. Because when I'm facing something that I don't know the answer to, I want to have the answer spelled out, right? He's like, ah, oh, it's just up the road. I'm like, well, where is it? He's like, well, it's this town, and you just go up here a ways. We're going to take the south right way instead of the north way. I'm like, I didn't know there was another way. He's like, oh, I think I know how to get there. And I'm like, would somebody please give the guy a map? Like, I don't want to do this. So we get to uh, the place that we used to go when we were kids to fill up with gas, and there was a mobile station on the corner that hadn't been in operation in like 30 years. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it gets worse. It totally does. So by this time, I'm not just worried. My kids are worried. And they're like, Dad, do you think we're going to get there? And I'm like, oh, who knows? I don't know. And what I said to my kids was very calculated in this moment. I said, well, Grandpa thinks we'll get there. Because now if we don't get there, it ain't my fault. It's, their, it's his fault. Like, put the blame on his shoulders. And I said, Dad, well, what's going to happen if we don't get there? And I'm like, who knows? You kids will walk to the next gas station. I don't know. And by this time, all of a sudden, my dad starts trying to play it cool, but still looking kind of at the screen like, I don't know, I don't know if we're here. So then we end up stopping. We end up stopping somebody in the road who's looking at us really with a weird way. And I said, hey, do you know if there's a gas station anywhere close? And he said, oh, yeah, you just go up to Osage. And I said, well, I, I know at this point we have 13 miles left until we're empty. And I said, do you know how far it is to Osage? And he's like, it's just up the road a little bit. I'm like, would somebody just shoot me straight? Like, if it's 15 miles, just let me know, because then I'll get my dad starting to walk now. <laughs> sure enough, we make it to Osage. We had, I think, it, it, like, it was low. Like, it was, we, when we filled up the car with gas, it was a 16-gallon tank, and we put over 16 gallons in. <laughs> and so my dad said, hey, could you go inside and pay for it? And I went up with his credit card. And I looked at the lady and I said, could you just tack on a tip to that a little bit? And, like, I want this painful for him. <laughs> because I was in a place where I needed to know an answer. And the only thing that I could tell and I was certain of was uncertainty. And that's really hard, isn't it? And unfortunately, I think a, a lot of us find ourselves a lot of times in life facing an intersection. And when we ask ourselves, how is it that we're ever going to find a, a way out of this situation? The only thing that we can come up with in our own mind is, who knows? Like it could go this way or it could go that way. And I don't know which way it's going to go. And it feels as if everything is up and it's in limbo. And that's why this story that we're going to walk through this morning is so incredibly important. We're in the last week of our series that we've been doing through the month of July, which can you believe tomorrow's August? That's bananas. But the series has been called Let Me Tell You a Story where we've been able to focus on some of our fav favorite Bible stories. In anticipation of this series, a lot of people ask me, like, hey, what's, what, what, what story are you going to choose? What's your favorite Bible story? And that's really, that's really hard, to be honest. And there are different ones that I like at different times in different ways. 
It's kind of like when I was teaching high school, uh, high school English, I'd always have students that would be like, Mr. Johnson, who's your favorite student? And I always would say, well, it's not you. And they'd be like, well, who is it? I'm like, well, it's not you. And they said, well, tell me. It's like, well, it's, hard, it's too hard to tell. You're all different. And I relate to you differently. But the story that you heard read for you just a few minutes ago is a story from the book of Esther. And the book of Esther is an incredibly powerful uh, story found in the Old Testament. What's really unique in a couple different ways, many different ways, but a couple that I find very fascinating is one, it's, it's a book in the Bible that's named after a woman, which you know is pretty significant. Male-dominated culture. So there's, there has to be something about Esther that's, that's pretty unique. And the other thing that's really interesting about the, the book of Esther is, is God is never explicitly mentioned. Which is a really helpful reminder to me. Because sometimes I can get caught in this my, a way of thinking that only if I name it or if somebody names it that God is present, that God could be present. I think about the story of Moses in, in Exodus chapter 3. And, and Moses is out and he's at the edges of his fields. And he's in the edges of the field. And all of a sudden God appears to him in a burning bush and says, Moses, take off your sandals because you're walking on holy ground. And, and it's not like just in that moment that that ground became holy. And it wasn't like just in that moment that all of a sudden God mysteriously and miraculously became present. That God was there the whole time. But Moses just recognized it at that particular time. I think about the psalmist in Psalm 24 that says, the earth is the Lord's and everything inside of it. And everybody inside of it, the world and all of its people. Everybody say all of its people. Belong to him. Which is really helpful for me. And I think it's really important for us to remember that there is not a single person on the face of the earth that has not been created in the image of God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including all of its people, and they belong to him. And so God is not explicitly mentioned in the book of Esther, but God's all over the place in this story. And some of you know the story quite well, and some of you, it's, it's foreign to you. You've never ventured into this story. And so I want to kind of get you to the place that we heard in the Bible reading in just a very quick synopsis. There was a, a king, and his name was Xerxes. And Xerxes was the king of a place called Susa. And there was a queen, and her name was Vashti. And there was a day where, where Xerxes called the Vashti and said Vashti needed to come, but she didn't obey the king. And, and some of the king's men said to the king, they said, hey, if people in this land find out that the queen doesn't obey the king, what is that going to mean to us? So you got to get rid of her. And what we find out is Xerxes is somebody who doesn't have much of a backbone. He's easily swayed by the people around him. And so he caves into it, and he banishes Vashti from the kingdom. And so now he's in pursuit of somebody who can be queen. And so he holds basically a pageant to, to have all of the young women will be brought and they will come before the king and he will choose the one that he f feels is the most suitable to become the next queen. Well, in the land of Susa, there's a woman by the name of Esther. And she has an uncle and a, kind of a cousin. His name is Mordecai. And yes, this story is about Esther, but it's also about Mordecai, and it's about their faithfulness. And Mordecai says to Esther, Esther, you need to go before the king, because Esther, certainly, if you go before the king, he will choose you, he will select you, you will become queen. But Esther, you've got to promise me that if you go before the king, you, you cannot disclose the fact that you are Jewish. You can't share your faith with the king. Because if they were to find out that you are somebody who follows God, you would never be chosen. And so Esther agrees. Sure enough, she goes before the king and the king selects her and Esther becomes queen. Now the king had a right-hand person, right-hand man. His name was Haman. And, and Haman is, is evil personified. He's horrible. He's deplorable. He's greedy, he's power hungry, he's vicious. And Mordecai, not Mordecai, but Haman so 
badly wants people to know how much power he has, that he convinces the king that if the king or Hammond walks around the streets of the city that everybody should have to, to bow down in, in reverence or in, in worship of them. Well, one day as Hammond is walking around, he comes across Mordecai's path. And it's not that Mordecai is rebellious, but Mordecai is not going to worship anything or anyone but God. And it doesn't matter how alluring or powerful those things might seem. That he knows what God's commands are. And he takes them seriously. And so he refuses to bow down and this enrages Hammond. And so Hammond goes to the king and says to the king, you have a certain group of people that are in your midst. And if you don't get rid of them, you're going to find yourself in incredible trouble. And so you need to literally, the translation says, you need to annihilate them. To get rid of every single one of them. And so now Mordecai reaches out to Esther and says, Esther, we're at an intersection here. And it's time. Esther, it's time. You need to go to the king and you need to reveal who you are and reveal whose you are. And Esther responds and she says, Mordecai, I... I understand what you're saying, but the only reason that I'm queen is because there was somebody that was before me that didn't obey what the king ordered. And the only people that can go before the king are the ones that he summons. And he hasn't summoned me for over 30 days. What you're asking me to do, Mordecai, Esther says, it's impossible. It's too much. I can't possibly do what I know is right for me to do. I know that what we're facing is, is something that's going to alter everything. But, but, more, but Mordecai, I, I can't do that. It seems that the, the gap that exists between where I am and where you're calling me to go is, is too great. And so Esther has a decision what she's going to do when she faces something that seems to be impossible. And I wonder what that thing is for you. I mean, look, we're all human beings that have lives that don't always go exactly the way that we want them to go. And I'm certain that there are plenty of us that are here today or listening to this right now that are facing something that we never would have thought or dreamed would be a part of our story. But it feels as if the road has ended. I don't know, maybe for you it's, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe there's a relationship that's been a part of your life for so long and it always seems like that relationship came so naturally to you and to this person. And somehow, somewhere along the way, it just, it began to drift. And you'd love to be able to to reconcile it, but it just seems to be impossible. Maybe you find yourself in a a financial situation where you've tried to get ahead for so long, but it seems like the more you try to get ahead financially, you... You get farther and farther and farther behind and to ever be able to get out from under the rock that you found yourself, it seems to be impossible. Maybe it's the fact that you have kids in your house that you feel like you're losing them. And man, so desperately you want to try to get them back. But it seems as if they want nothing to do with you. And so to bring it back to the way that it was, it seems to be impossible. 
Maybe it's the fact that you just don't know what life is like to feel normal any longer. And to feel the way that you once felt seems to be impossible. So what happens when we face the impossible? Who gets to guide us? Who gets to encourage us? Who do we start to listen to? Who do we stop listening to? This isn't just something that is kind of detached from this Bible story. This is exactly where Esther found herself. And what we see in this story is this story is a story that's it's all about faith. Not a faith that's detached from a reality. Not a faith that's, that's putting, putting your head in the sand. That's kind of like plugging your ears and saying, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. No, a faith that's real. And you say, no, but Jeremy, that's the problem. Faith has never been easy like that for me. And if that's you, I just want to give you a word of encouragement. You are not alone. Faith by definition, not my definition, by a biblical definition. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the assurance of things that we hope for, and it's the conviction of things that we just can't see. He said, that's not helping. Let's dig into the story. See how this story relates to our story. First thing we find out in this story is that faith that allows us and gives us the gift to face reality. When every fiber in us wants to pretend like what's happening isn't actually happening. I'll never forget it. When our daughter was about three or four years old, she came down from her bedroom one night and she's like, I can't sleep in my room anymore. And we're like, oh, no, okay, let's, let's have a conversation about that. You ain't sleeping with us. So why can't you sleep in your room anymore? She's like, there's a monster under my bed. And so I thought I would do the logical thing and talk to and discuss this with her. So I could reason with her the fact that there is no monster under her bed. And I said, sweetheart, what does the monster look like? And she says, no, daddy, I'd never look. I just know he's there. Which we sometimes do with those monsters in our lives. told the story before, but when our son was in the band-aid stage of life, which every kid goes through the band-aid stage of life, where you spend like $7,000 on band-aids because they put it like off their earlobes and on their wrists and everywhere you can imagine. There's band-aids everywhere. But he actually had a cut that deserved a band-aid. And what are band-aids used for? Are band-aids used to heal or are band-aids used to cover? They're used to, to cover. So our son put a band-aid on his cut to stop the bleeding. And it was the middle of the summer and he was a little boy who was nasty and gross. And so his Band-Aid had gotten nasty and gross and it was just like, oof. And so I looked at him one day and I'm like, hey, buddy, it was like three days. He hadn't showered in three days. That was his mom's fault. But um, <laughs> and actually it wasn't. Uh, I said, but you got you to gotta take your Band-Aid off. I said, no, Dad, if I take my Band-Aid off, my, my cut's not going to heal. And so I need to keep it covered up. I said, no, buddy, that's not what it's for. And the only thing that's going to heal that cut is if you, you reveal it. You, you give that thing some air. And maybe the thing that you've been facing for so long that seems to be so impossible, maybe one of the most difficult parts of you is actually acknowledging and admitting that that thing is there. But what faith gives us the ability to do is is to face it. That's what Mordecai said to Esther. 
said, don't think for a moment, Esther, that because you're in the palace, you alone will escape when all the other Jews are killed. There is something going on, Esther, and you can pretend that this isn't reality, but let me tell you what reality is. It's not because I don't love you, Esther, that I'm telling you that things have gotten to a point, the intersection is in such a place where, Esther, you need to do something, and you are not void of the fallout of what this is going to be. And Esther, you need to face it. And in facing it, you're going to realize that faith gives us the opportunity to see a bigger reality. Because it's those hidden, covered things of our life that begin to be the monstrous things. And we start to make them out to be more than they actually are, don't we? I mean, think about all the mental space that you give those things, that I give those things. Faith says, hey, let's, let's look at this, not from what you're thinking about it, but from what God can, can do about it. Mordecai says to Esther, Esther, there's, there's a reality that God made a promise. He made a promise, Esther, way before you were even alive. And the promise that he made, Esther, is that he was going to be in relationship with his people. And there was never anything that his people were going to face that would be bigger than the promise that he has for them. And we need to be reminded of the very same thing. That the same God who's working through Mordecai to Esther that says, Esther, there's a God who has a promise that he will bring deliverance to his people. That that same God is there for, for you and he's there for me. And our problems don't outweigh God's promise. Because his promise is too big. And the Bible says he'll never sleep and he'll never slumber on his promises for you and for me. Mordecai knew that this God had pr made a promise to Abraham and Sarah and had promised that he would create through them a nation that would outnumber the stars in the sky. And, and even though it was the most unlikely of situations, it actually happened because God makes good on his promise. And, and Mordecai knew that, that God had made a promise to a guy by the name of Moses that, that he would bring freedom through that holy ground experience, that he would bring freedom to, to all of the Israelites. And even though it seems so incredibly unlikely that God could use somebody like that to do something like that, God actually made good on his promise. And Mordecai knew that in that fleeing experience that Moses and the Israelites had that they faced something that seemed like the biggest obstacle that they could ever see. As they were fleeing the Egyptians, they ran into the Red Sea and so they had the impassable and the impenetrable. But God had made a promise and so the sea parts and the Israelites walk on the dry land. And so Mordecai doesn't say this to Esther based on some wish and some figment of his imagination. He says it because he knows it to be true. That the God who moved once will continue to move again. So God said through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for a future that's filled with hope. God didn't say that to his people when things were going incredibly well. God said that to his people when they were at an intersection of life where it could have, it felt like it could have gone that way or that and neither, neither way was good. But they trusted and they had faith, not based on what they could see, but what but what God had done. That's why we share these stories all the time. It's because we can have confidence in what God's gonna do 
when we know what God's already done. And so then Esther has the opportunity to step into her reality. And that's what faith allows us to do. To step in against the giant, as David did. So Mordecai says to Esther, Esther, who knows, but you found yourself in this position of power, of honor, of being one of the few people in the world that the king would listen to. And who knows that you found yourself in this position for such a time as this. It wasn't that God wanted the Israelites to be in that position and in that place. Because they were suffering. And God doesn't will suffering. God will use it most definitely. But he doesn't will it. He doesn't want it. No, God's design and God's hope is that there would be no more weeping, no more sorrow, no more tears, that all of those things would be gone forever. That's the promise that we read about in the book of Revelation. That God's hope isn't that somehow we would face something that, that seems to be so insurmountable that we would lose our hope. No, God's, God's better than that. But God can use it no matter where we are. And for Esther, it was time. And I wonder if it's time for you. In that place that feels impossible. Maybe today is the first day of the new way. Where you say, you know what, I... I feel like, I feel like I, I don't want that anymore. But I've never felt like I could be free from that. Maybe it's time. It's time to let God do what, what God does. That God's design and God's hope is for us to live an abundant life. And God can work through any circumstance. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. That God will work together in all things for the good. That nothing is beyond God's redemption and God's restoration. Which literally means to put the pieces back together one at a time. To be made new. And who doesn't want that? Because when we face those intersections, so often we feel like we're facing them all alone. And here's the best part of the story. His faith assures us that we're never alone. When I was a fifth grader, <clears throat> I was 10 years old, I was diagnosed as type 1 diabetic. I don't say that because I want pity. My life has been wonderful. It's been great. It has not been slowed down by that at all. And I will not let it get slowed down by that at all. But I tell you that because at that moment, I had to go to the doctor every six months. So every six months from the time that I was diagnosed, and one of the things that uh, happened is my dad told me from the time I was diagnosed, I will go to every single appointment with you. And he did. He would adjust his work schedule. He would adjust any meeting. He was there at every single appointment I ever had. And then all of a sudden I got to the age where I was able to drive myself. And all of a sudden I got to the age where the doctors were asking me questions that I didn't want my dad in the room while I was answering them. And so my dad got to the point where he'd say, do you want me to step outside? And I'd say, yeah, please. And then I got to the age where I went to college and I wasn't living under their roof anymore. And I wasn't even telling him about when my appointments were. And something that seared into my memory, and it's not because my dad is the greatest dad. Remember the gas story. <laughs> but he was good. 
And I pulled up to uh, an appointment, my first appointment when I was in college. And I'll never forget it because I was running way late. So I screech into the parking lot and I get out and all of a sudden I see a car in the parking lot. And whose car do you think it is? It's my dad's. And so I'm running into the clinic and I stop by his car and I said, Dad, I thought I told you not to be here. He said, I don't need to be here. And I know you don't need me here, but I never want you to go through one of these alone. You didn't ask for this. And I want you to know that I am with you. When we face those things, it's hard. It is. It's just that's the reality of it. But know that you're not going into it alone. Because God's got a bigger promise for you. He tells you that that doesn't get to be the end for you, but he also tells you that you're not going to fight that thing by yourself. The closing scene of this movie, Top Gun, it's like one of the most inspirational scenes of my cheesy 80s movie love. Uh, But Maverick hasn't been able to engage, but now it's time. And there's a situation that develops where they need the top pilots, and so he's called upon. But the problem is, is one, he's scared, but two, he doesn't want to do it alone. And he doesn't know who he has that will fly with him. And what he doesn't know is all the people who would never leave him. Take a look. What are you doing? You're slowing down. You're slowing down. I'm bringing him in closer, Merlin. You're going to do what? This is it, Maverick. I'm going to hit the brakes. He'll fly right by. He's going to get a lock on us. Now. I got a good lock. Firing. Mustang, this is Voodoo 3. Remaining MIGs are bugging out. Mustang, this is Maverick requesting flyby. Negative Ghost Rider, the pattern is full. Uh, QB, something I should know about? Thank you. still dangerous. You can be my wingman anytime. You can be mine. See what you realize when you boil down the story, not just of Top Gun, not just of Esther, But the story of life is it's about presence. Not the presence that we we receive, but the presence that's with us. 
Let me tell you a little bit about Jesus. That there is a God who loves you so much. That thought about eternity existing without you being able to be a part of it. So he humbled himself. He took on the form of a human being. He subjected himself to all of the things that any of us who have skin on are subjected to. Because he loves us. Because he wanted to be present with us. I mean, in John's gospel, it says, and his name would be Emmanuel, which literally means God is with us. And this God who is present would go to a cross, and on the cross he'd put to death our, our sin and the reality of evil and death so that we would know that we know that we know that all of the things that can stand between us and the life that God created us to live are not impossible. That through all things, or through God, all things are possible. Jesus promised, he says, be sure of this. He says to before he ascends into heaven, be sure of this. Don't forget this. Life is going to throw intersections at you. You're going to hit the stop signs. You're going to find situations in your life where you're like, who knows? So Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He did it for Abraham. He did it for Jacob. He did it for Noah. He did it for the Israelites. He did it for the disciples, and he does it for you. It's time. So as we go this week, go in that walking not by our sight, but by his promise. We're going to close today, and we're going to close with a song, and I want you to listen to these lyrics. I invite you to stand. And this song hits directly onto this theme. During the song, prayer partners are going to come up. They're going to get into place. If you'd love to have someone pray for you, we'd love to pray for you. But just listen. Let these songs, let these lyrics be a reminder of you, of the God who didn't stop acting here, but who always will be acting here. Amen? Amen.
children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer. Come on, sing this. You are the same. We believe you are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same. Yes, you are. Because you are the same God. God did then so we can have faith in what God will do now. So walk in that faith. It's time. We'll have prayer partners available that would love to pray with you and for you. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Have a wonderful week. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll see you next week. Thank you again for joining us for worship this morning. What an incredible morning it's been. And we hope that you've been filled with that love and that joy in receiving the promise that God is always with us. And so we pray that you take that out with you this week. We're praying a blessing over your week ahead. Remember, God is with you wherever you go. We'll be back again next week, same time, same place. As always, you're welcome to join us in person or online. Have a great week.